Well, good afternoon. You guys are the troopers. Welcome to the uh, session today. <clears throat> Excuse me. On uh, what ladders do I need to climb and how do I climb them? Uh, my name is Tim Kasperzak. I'm a program director at Metro Health Case Western in Cleveland. Um, I have the distinct honor of moderating a session that I'm actually the junior faculty to a uh, very distinguished, um, long-standing, outstanding faculty um, in the AUR. Um, we're going to jump right in. I'm actually going to start with uh, Dr. Eric Stern. Um, he is going to uh, start the presentation, and Dr. McLeod will then uh, follow. So, Dr. Stern. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces, friendly faces in the audience. It's nice to see everybody. So last year at the AUR, Teresa and I were sitting around brainstorming like we often do, and we had uh, this conversation about, so wouldn't it be great to have a topic at, at AUR about, so you want to be a section head? And so here we are. Just like that. That's just like magic. If you want to know how do you get a topic on the program, talk to Teresa. And it magically happens. So in full disclosure, I have no financial disclosures other than I, I am a faculty member at the University of Washington. But in full disclosure, I am not a section head, nor do I ever want to be a section head. <laughs> but I know section heads. <laughs> so. so the advice I'm going to offer today is just that. It's advice. It's free advice, and you know what you can do with free advice. But it may or may not apply to you and your situation because every one of our situations is a little bit different. So it should apply to you, uh, and you'll have to sort of filter it into your own uh, particular situations because it does depend on your personal and professional goals, your reason for wanting to even think about being a section head. It depends on your leadership style and your chairs, vision, and leadership style. And, and a big part of it, of course, is the institutional and departmental culture and the size of your section head. Teresa's section, at, uh, we're both chest radiologists. Her section uh, probably has, what do you have, 12, 15 chest radiologists, something like that. And at the University of Washington, we're smaller. We have about five of us. So the dynamics will be different depending on the size of the section you're willing or wishing to lead. But the ideas that I will share with you are very general. It's a 30,000 foot view of leadership more than anything. And it should be applicable to most situations. So if you want to be a section head, you need to really think about and reflect on what are your motivations. If your motivation is more money or more time, it may not be the right motivation, may not be the proper motivation. I think any kind of leadership you need to have the interests of the people under your charge as the prime motivation. Your inspiration to lead and the motivation to lead need to be aligned, of course, with uh, the department. I think if you're going to think about leading, you need to think about making a difference. How am I going to impact? How am I going to make this a better place? Don't do it just for the sake of doing it. Don't do it because you'd rather be you than some other guy. But do it because you want to make a difference. When I think about what section heads do, they wear multiple hats, but they really should be focusing on the four-legged stool of academics. And the four legs are the domains, of course, of administration, clinical service, research, <clears throat> and education. The only way to be successful in any of this is to be cooperative with your chair. Share the vision, share, feel like a collaborative member of the team, how we can do things together, how to improve the, the milieu for everybody in the section and the department and in the institution. Team is an acronym. It's a kind of a, a leadership motivating acronym for together everyone achieves more. Never was there a better example than this team of ragtag misfits. I'm sure that you can see yourself in one of those characters, but this team came together and they saved the world, right? So that's our goal. Mark, which one are you? So I think leaders 
need to be strategic in their thinking, of course, when they're talking about uh, taking on such a mantle of uh, leadership. So you want to promote a strong culture of institutional stewardship, strong commitment to effective business operations, and then the little things like efficient use of space, what offices people get, how do we set up our reading rooms, and then being really willing to realign resources with evolving strategies because the strategies will change over time. This alignment is essential. This is part of like being a team. If you have a, one of your oars is out of alignment or if your, one of your pistons is not firing the way it should be, you will not be effective and you will not be as impactful. So alignment and team is clearly really important, aligning the faculty and the staff with the culture and the department. Being patient-centered, of course, is essential. So when you're thinking about the clinical service needs, the clinical operations, you, your role as a section is to ensure those clinical operations are functioning smoothly, that they are patient-centered, efficient, and effective, that there's a culture of patient safety, and that the patient, uh, the clinical operations also then support the department's education and research missions. And as you're thinking about the clinical operations, it's important to anticipate the needs for the clinical services. And that often then leads into the importance of recruiting and retaining faculty. So recruiting and retaining is essential. And that needs, I think that's really important that that be one of the skill sets of a good section head. And it is a skill set, learning how to keep people happy, how to re recruit new people into the section. And when you're doing that, think about how to do it in a world in which diversity and cultural competence are coming into focus and are of paramount importance in terms of being a good leader and being uh, a good section head. Depending upon your institution, uh, advancing the research activities in your section are going to be also something that are, are one of the four legs of the stool. And then from an education perspective, you have to think about all the aspects of education in your department and in your section. And that is everything from medical students to pre-medical students, uh, residents and application process, fellows, visiting fellows, Visitors, everybody that might come through your section and department, that needs to be something that you really give time and attention to. They need a lot of care and nurturing for sure. And then while you have all this going on, one of the keys to any kind of leadership is to be a good communicator. And there are seven C's of effective communication. And I'll just go through these very quickly. The credibility is essential. You have to build trust within your section and with your all your colleagues and the students and the staff. Being courteous is it helps improve any of the relationships that you'll be in. Clarity, being clear in the, in your comments and your statements and your leadership style is very important. You have to be correct. This helps build confidence. Be consistent. Nobody likes inconsistent messages. Be concrete and be concise. So if you were to summarize even this slide, you would say that it's a, like anything in life, you need to earn trust and confidence. And you have those are skills that you can certainly learn. So this is just my last slide as a brief intro to the session. The things that would make you a good section head are the things that make you a good any kind of leader. And those are just being responsible being trustworthy, and having passion for what you want to do. And with that, uh, Teresa McLeod now, I will introduce, she's going to uh, look at this topic in a little bit more granular way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. You're always a hard act to follow. So I'm Teresa McLeod, and I'm a thoracic radiologist. I was division head for more than 20 years, and I'm now a vice chair for education, no longer a division head, but very actively involved half time in clinical work in the thoracic radiology division. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is to give you an outline of specific steps that I think are strategic 
uh, in pursuing your particular interest in being a division head? What do you have to do? How would your department chair recognize you as a potential division head? And if may, situations may differ. You may, if you really, this is a passion, this is what you want to do, and you feel you're not advancing in your career, you might have to pick up and move elsewhere because there may be a well-established uh, division head who's fairly young and doesn't want to step down from that post. Or alternatively, there may be somebody thinking of doing something else in the department or perhaps uh, retiring or whatever, and there may be an opportunity for you at your own division. So you have to consider those options, obviously. So I'm going to talk about what I think of the qualifications uh, and uh, provide you, I hope, with a roadmap to reaching your goal. And you don't have to undertake all of these activities, but I think it's important to be engaged in each of the realms that I'm going to talk about. And what are the qualifications? I, you know, I'm a program director, so maybe this looks like the milestones here, the competencies, but I think they're going to carry through your entire life. Um, and we'll talk about each of them. Clinical expertise and innovation, scholarship and research, teaching and mentoring, leadership experience and training, reputation, and then administrative management and business skills. Now, what do I mean by clinical expertise and innovation? First of all, try to be the best you can be and maybe the best in your department and your subspecialty area from a clinical point of view. You are the go-to radiologist in your division. Uh, people respect the depth of your expertise, the knowledge about your subspecialty area, your eye, how good are your perceptual abilities, how well do you in integrate what you see on a CT and MR scan with the, clinical, um, um, uh, with the clinical information you have and the clinical perspective that comes from the physicians taking care of the patient. You're someone that goes to multidisciplinary conferences. You provide help to clinicians. And if you're in a subspecialty area with a lot of patient contact, like IR or mammography, you are very dedicated to patient care. So this is important. Uh, the respect that you have in the hospital and from the specialists that refer to your division and the development of good patient care skills. Now, innovation is something, and I borrowed this from actually the Harvard Criteria for Promotion. There is a track called Clinical Expertise and Innovation. But do you create things that are new in your division? And it doesn't have to be an original idea that you have. There may be something that's published. Maybe there's a new procedure. There's some sort of new technique for patient care or for interpretation or whatever. Or maybe there's a new technology coming on the horizon and you help implement that within your division. So you can introduce new procedures in the chest division. Just as I finished my term as division head, we started doing radiofrequency ablation, and actually Joanne Shepard went and trained in it, came back, and together we introduced that into the division. Well-established practice. It was fairly new on the horizon, but be the first in your department to make this available and support it and show your department chair that you can really keep your division or the division that you hope to head on the forefront of practice. You might do things that uh, uh, are related to our practice. You might implement, for, a, for example, the ACR appropriateness criteria as they apply to your subspecialty interest in thoracic and make sure that's implemented and that people use it within your division. Now, scholarship and research, this is like how to get promoted, but it replies as well to a leadership position if you want to attain one. Build a CV and build a good CV. And of course, the most important thing is publishing and peer reviewed and well respected journals. But you can do clinical research, it doesn't have to be basic research. Chapters can be important, uh, being a co editor on a book, because that shows your reputation as an expert in your clinical area. Do reviews uh, as well, but the emphasis being on number one, which are the peer reviewed publications. Uh, I know someone in my department who became well-known in his field, but, and he published a lot of very good research, but he didn't think going to meetings were important. So he never went to the RSNA and the rank and ray and didn't present scientific abstract. You've got to be known. You have to build a reputation as an expert in your field. So present good scientific abstracts. Then make sure you write them up in the form of manuscript, but develop a presence as a subspecialty leader at both subspecialty meetings and national meetings. 
Now, teaching and mentoring, that may not be a primary focus, but it's important. Uh, you should engage medical students and be engaged in resident teaching and educational activities. You don't have to have a major leadership role, but you might want to do that. The important thing is be a mentor to trainees and members of your division. You might be coming a little bit more at the intermediate or senior level, so reach out to the young people in your division and mentor them. You may want to take on an administrative position within the division that will show that you have the administrative and leadership skills to run a division. And if you're particularly interested in education, you might want to become a fellowship director. I mean, most subspecialties do offer fellowships. You learn how to administrate uh, an educational training program and work with, mentor, and teach uh, residents and fellows. So how do you build a reputation? Well, that's extra work, folks. I hate to say this, but you have to get known. It's, it's like, I hate to say it's, it, it's not like the current presidential election, but you do need to get out there and, and network. And that means by giving service. It's not all, all about you. It's about actually the field of radiology and giving service to radiology. And what I did, you know, I was in Boston, and I joined the New England Rank and Race Society, and I go to their meetings fairly faithfully, and somebody came to me and said, you know, you seem to be interested in this organization. Would you like to serve in some committees? And I said, yes. And then, you know, I got very involved, and eventually became president of that organization. And the same is true on the national and the international level. And it's work. It's service work. Uh, uh, you won't uh, be promoted in these organizations. You won't get known unless you do good service. And by good service, I mean that you not only volunteer, but you get things done. And you also have leadership qualities to bring committees together and, and organize the work and, uh, and know how to work with the group and make that group accomplish certain ends. Uh, accept invitations for grand rounds that may occur locally in your area, in your city, if there are other medical schools there, and at other institutions, eventually nationally and so forth, but give grand rounds and get known. Uh, if somebody asks you to serve on an editorial board, that's very important for your CV, and it's another way of having uh, building a reputation. And I can't emphasize enough, uh, give service. And this benefits your career, but more importantly, benefits our specialty of radiology by uh, doing committee work and eventually having an office of physician and subspecialty in national societies. Be a good citizen in your own department. Be a good citizen in your division. Uh, comply with the rules, you know, have things done on time. Uh, don't have the division head see you as a, one of your problem people in the division. In fact, you want to be sure that you support the current division head and you make the division work. So get things done efficiently and in a timely manner. Hold your weight with the clinical loads. Uh, Eric was talking about how important uh, the clinical mission is, and uh, you may be interested in promoting your career and becoming a division head and doing a lot of work within the division that isn't clinical, but you don't want your colleagues in that division to feel that you're just being self-promoting and you're not helping doing the clinical work, especially if you have the clinical expertise. So you have to be willing to put in the extra time that you put your weight with the clinical role. Develop new ideas for the division. Probably have division meetings. Maybe you have some unique idea about clinical practice, teaching, or whatever, but be a contributor. And the important thing is work well with them. And Eric emphasized that. You have to be inclusive, and you have to be sensitive to other people's needs. You know, if somebody has to switch a day when they're working on the weekend or on call, or they have special circumstances, you know, be somebody that uh, reaches out to other people and accepts their needs and be, you know, be a team player and be uh, sensitive to others within the division. So being a good citizen in the department, comply with the rules. Don't say, you know, you're not a high-maintenance faculty member to your division head or to the head of the department. You do things as they you comply with the rules in a timely fashion. You give committee service to the department. There are many departments, many committees and departments in which you can uh, take a role and you may eventually become a chair of a committee that may be important. Um, national service to radiology, I mentioned that. Be a volunteer. So you can start with your local radiologic society and then national and subspecialty societies and be happy to review manuscripts and provide other services. Now, this, I think, is more and more important. And uh, when I, am in a much more junior level, took over the chest division, uh, there was very little support for leadership experience and training. And it's become very much more complex, I think. Uh, there are much more expected of division heads than there were 
when I first took over that position quite a few years ago. You're expected to know a lot about all that leadership entails uh, in a radiology department because you're going to be uh, invaluable to the administration of the department on many levels. It may depend a lot about how big your department is, how much hands-on management is done by, say, the vice chairs or the chair, but well, we're a very large department and the division's chiefs have a lot of responsibility and take on a lot of tasks, so you have to be prepared for them. Now, there are many ways you can prepare for leadership experience and training. A radiology leadership uh, institute, I think you're all familiar with, the American College of Radiology has symposium and sessions and a whole program to foster leadership in young people. And then the RSNA in conjunction, I think they would originally started this, but with other organizations, Rankin Ray, the AUR also has the Academy of Leadership and Management. Now, what are these other skills you need for leadership components in order to be successful as a division chief? You have to have some financial skills. I put accounting 101 there, but you know, many of us grow up uh, without an awful lot of sense of business. You know, we, in the old days, I would say balance your checkbook, but you know, we, nobody has a checkbook anymore, but you really need to know a bit about finance. Human resources, these are all the topics that are covered by these leadership institutes. Professionalism, how you uh, act in a, in a professional manner. They'll deal with ethics as well and how you promote professionalism in your colleagues. Legal contracting. The academic mission of the institution and how you establish that and then general management issues. So you really need skills in all these areas. Now there's a lot available on the web. David Newsom has a wonderful program on the business of radiology. It's intended for residents and other trainees, but for the junior staff as well, when you may not be familiar with a lot of these issues, it's very easy. There are a series of about eight to 10 seminars that you can just do in your spare time. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is you really need to understand our healthcare system which I think is beyond all of us at the moment. I, I'm not sure the government understands it, or the health policy quonks uh, understand it either. But you should try to keep up to date. Uh, it will impact what you do as a division. You'll be a great help to your chairman and your administrators if you really understand how the healthcare system is evolving, how reimbursement occurs, all these healthcare policy issues that are extremely important. So. Then these are all things that I think you can self-train in and get the, um, that the qualities that are necessary. And if there, again, is a committee in your department dealing with set specific issues of administration or healthcare policy, join those committees and you'll only learn more and uh, increase your abilities. So I know it's a little bit after St. Patrick's Day, but coming from Boston, I have to wish everybody a good luck, and I put a few shamrocks there and other Irish good wishes. So thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully we'll have a little chance for questions later on. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna keep things moving along here, and uh, what I will do is, um, so on my slide, if I can, did I break the projector? How do I do this twice in, uh, twice in one day? All right, for those of you that may not be aware, this actually happened to me a little bit earlier today, so I uh, do not have uh, shamrocks around me or four-leaf clovers right now, so I'm a bad luck charm. Um, so my presentation is on how to chair a meeting, and I have purposely put uh, my titles on my initial slide, and the, and the reason for that is because I'm arrogant and want you all to see everything that I do. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Um, so, uh, no, the reason I did that is uh, to give you a sense that, uh, you know, as a radiologist, you can become, as Teresa said, very involved by just volunteering and then things snowball. I've actually been fortunate enough to be elected to uh, president-elect of our medical staff for our hospital, which is kind of a unique uh, role for radiologists, particularly, a, I think, a, more of a younger radiologist. 
such as myself. Every birthday I keep thinking I get younger and um, when I do my millennial presentations I'm reminded of how old I'm getting. Uh, <clears throat> that also was supposed to be funny, so two for two on jokes, two for two on presentations. Okay, so we will just hop right in and I just, just by show of hands, let's have a little bit of fun. Um, have any of you ever, you know, you go to a meeting and, and you walk out of that meeting and you say, what, what just happened? What happened in that meeting? You know, do I even know what we accomplished? Do I know what we talked about? All right, so there's a decent number of you. Has anybody been in a meeting and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for this to get over with and I just don't know what we're talking about and I'm so frustrated and I can't talk and just want to get out of here. Okay, so we've all had that experience. <clears throat> Has anyone had a meeting been derailed by a phone? Someone on the phone, uh, checking their phone, giving a Facebook update, maybe not entirely derailed, but somewhat distracted. Uh, I think we've probably seen that happen a few times. And then this is one of my favorites, or pet peeves, I should say. Uh, this is a Dilbert cartoon, so, you know, Dilbert's waiting and he said, you know, the guy's coming and says, well, I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late for our 1050 meeting. And Dilbert says, well, I have to reschedule because I have another meeting at 11. And the next person says, reschedule, I'm only 10 minutes late. And they say, well, tell that to my 1110. And so I think we've all had, you know, those meetings that perpetually seem to get pushed back farther and farther and farther. Even though the start time was 1 o'clock, they seem now to start at 1.30 or something like that. So, you know, there is actually some uh, data here. Um, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit and tell you another reason I put those titles in there is to let you know that I'll be kind of weaving some of my anecdotal experience into this presentation as well as some data um, that has been suggested in the leadership and, and business meetings. But uh, this is actually an Infocom uh, paper that was prepared for Verizon. And what they did is they were looking at the future of uh, teleconferencing and the impact of productivity, the, the impact of meetings on productivity. And it was found that 91% of people daydream during meetings. I know I daydream during meetings. Uh, I check my phone sometimes during meetings, so it absolutely happens. I could not believe this number, though. 40% of people have said that they fell asleep during a business meeting. I mean, that is an incredible number of people that have fallen asleep. And 50% of the time in a meeting uh, during business meetings was found to be just wasted, just dead time, wasted time. So how do we, how do we get over that? Um, we're going to go into some of those tools, but there's actually something out there that was just published this January um, in the Harvard Business Review that actually quantifies the cost of a meeting. You can actually put in the number of participants, the average salary of the participants, and it'll tell you how much this meeting is actually costing you. Um, so it's another way to quantify how much uh, the meeting is actually costing you. So really, what now? You're all here in San Diego. Uh, you know, it's... Well, approaching 5 o'clock, I'm sure you're all thinking of the beer and pretzels we're going to be having, but you're here in the session, so really what now? There's a bridge here, you're all approaching leadership roles, how do we handle a meeting? So my goal here is to give you some practical tools, some anecdotes, um, so that can, hopefully you'll successfully be able to manage meetings in the future and chair a committee. Um, you know, we're really, there's a, a saying about uh, something like calm seas and sailors, not being good sailors if you don't have rough seas. So we're in California, I'll, I'll kind of morph that into a surfing analogy. And basically you need good waves, you need big, uh, large waves to really learn to be a good surfer. And so that's something you wanna uh, actually embrace in your career. You wanna embrace uh, leadership challenges. Um, and actually the role of a chair uh, of a committee, really you wanna mentor someone to eventually take your place. I was just talking to uh, Dr. Mullins, Mark Mullins here, who's going to speak after me. And um, one of the things that he's done is he's actually transitioning out of being program director. Um, but what we were talking about is he not only established policies and procedures, he also groomed someone to be able to step in when he steps down. So the, the operation will kind of continue. And that really is your role as a chair. I, I saw one of my residents in the room earlier, um, and I told her in, in, in various committee meetings that really this place should run completely fine without me. You really want to have things kind of set up in a way where procedures run uh, and policies run the committee, um, and you really want to have someone uh, that's ready to kind of step up and, and take your place. So really, let's just take the 30,000 foot view, or in this case, the, the from space view, and really talk about committee setup. 
you really want to understand when you're setting up a committee or you're taking on the, the role of chairing a committee, what is the scope? What is the scope of the committee? What is the purpose of the committee? Who empowers this committee? Is it a JACO-empowered committee? Is this something that the Board of Trustees wants? Is this a, a RRC requirement? Um, who is really empowering the committee? And understand your scope. Because then you will many, immediately kind of narrow down your purpose. Um, I'm, I'm sure none of you have been in meetings where you start talking about things like how you're going to solve uh, the world's hunger problems or who's going to win the next presidential election or anything like that, and where the meeting gets completely derailed. Um, if you just kind of focus on what your scope is, what you're trying to solve, um, you'll really kind of be able to make your meetings much more efficient. What's your deliverable? You are the stork. What are you delivering? What is, the, again, the purpose of the committee? What is your deliverable? Is it a report? Is it a recommendation? Is it just kind of making sure certain policies and procedures are followed? What is your deliverable? You also have to understand your budget. And I don't just mean by money, but you also have to understand your FTE allocation. You have to understand ancillary staff. How many people are going to be uh, involved in the committee and how much is going to be uh, allocated to the committee? And also the tasks. You need to be very clear then. So you've kind of started with what's our purpose? And now you're kind of working your way down to what are the actual tasks that the committee is going to be doing. So this all has to do with committee setup. What is our purpose? What are our tasks? Getting into a more practical approach, uh, you know, you want to think about how do you set up the agenda. And when a surveyor goes out and starts to survey an area, they don't just, you know, willy-nilly kind of start looking, oh, that corner looks good, I'll put a stake over there. And No, there's actually very detailed analysis done. And I would suggest that actually your agenda should be detailed as well. So you don't just want to put on the agenda, well, we're going to discuss the budget, right? What you want to do is say, we're going to discuss the 2014-2015 budget and look at it specifically how it had it uh, in regards to social events for, for, let's say, resident recruitment. And so you want to give the people that are on the committee the knowledge, a little bit more detail of what they're going to be uh, talking about. And you also want to have that agenda come out two or three days, at least two or three days ahead of time, a little bit more um, if you're going to have attachments like proposals and things to review. You also want to be clear on the agenda whether or not an item is for information, for discussion, or for decision. This will also very much kind of set up or queue up how the, the uh, session your meeting is going to go. Um, again, you want to make sure you share any reports that are going to be discussed. Um, you want to make things very clear and give committee members the opportunity to kind of uh, prepare themselves for the discussion um, so they know, okay, well, I'm just being told this because we're going to be disseminating this information. Or no, we're going to discuss this because the chair wants to get my input. Or we're actually going to be making a decision here on this, on this topic. And here's actually some data from that original uh, Verizon study to kind of support this. Um, that actually the more time you put into to the preparation, the more time you put into putting together your proposal, uh, putting together, let's say, goals, objectives, whatever it is that you're actually working on, actually it's the more productive the meeting is. Unfortunately, I don't know if what it, when they mean by productivity, if they mean by actual minutes uh, in the meeting or if it was a perception, but this is actually some data that shows that the more preparation you do um, in terms of the agenda, the, the more productive your meeting will be. So there's actually an art to this. I would argue there's actually an art to running a meeting. There's an art to setting up the agenda. There's an art to how this all gets queued up. And the reason I have these two pictures um, is actually you have to keep in mind the things that are going to be what I'll call easy, the things that everyone's going to kind of be swimming in the same direction. Um, and sometimes you may want to clump those things together. You may want to say, okay, I know all these things are going to be no-brainers. Everyone's going to get, let's say, we're voting on a raise and we're voting on more uh, admin time. And all, everyone's going to be in favor of these things. So we'll get all these things out of the way at once because everyone's going to be swimming in the same direction. And then understand which things will either potentially throw the committee into circles. Um, and so you really want to kind of queue up your agenda in a way that you, you kind of can kind of control the flow of the meeting. Um, we actually, uh, my resident here that's in the room can actually attest to this. We recently had a meeting uh, in our uh, program evaluation committee about goals and objectives. There was one that was coming up for discussion, and I thought it was a slam dunk. Um, I was being very naive. 
And uh, the committee basically just went around in circles and, and spun the, the committee time um, just on one uh, set of goals and objectives. And then I allowed that to happen. I didn't disrupt the process because I thought it was very important. I didn't want to, you know, interrupt it. Um, but then I had misread uh, kind of the, uh, the, the, what I perceived to be how easy that uh, agenda item uh, would be to kind of go through the committee. You also want to make very clear in the agenda uh, the end time of the meeting. Um, you want to know what's your finish line, either what's your end task, and, and if this is a regular meeting, what time does the meeting end and end it on time? Uh, people's time has become increasingly important. Pe people are also becoming increase increasingly protective of their time. And so you want to respect that as you would want your time respected by other uh, committee chair people. The corollary of that is I will say start on time. Um, you know, if, if committees don't start on time, if you're chairing a committee and it doesn't regularly start on time, what does that do? What that does is it basically starts to breed a culture of people thinking they can, they can start coming to the meeting late. So, all right, well, I saw, you know, Dr. X come to the meeting late, and then we stopped the committee meeting, and we went back, and we rehashed the things that we already decided, and now, now we've spent 25 minutes because Dr. X was late, and now I know, okay, well, next time this committee meets, I can be 10, 15 minutes late because we'll kind of go back and, and go over these topics. You really shouldn't do that. You really don't want to allow that culture to kind of fester. Um, and you say, well, what can you do about this, Tim? I say, well, start the meetings on time, right? You say you're going to start at noon, you start at noon. Obviously, if you have clinical, an emergent clinical situation, that, that would preclude that. But other than that, you really want to be consistent with starting on time. Um, one of the things that, and I have this guy with his paper bag over his head um, because of an idea that I read about in, in one of the business, uh, uh, business blogs was actually putting into the minutes who's late. And it's not necessarily to, to shame someone, and I'm kind of resistant to it because I don't like the idea of like shaming. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to focus on the negatives. Um, but what they, it's not just saying, okay, well, big bold letters, Dr. So-and-so was late. But what you do is you start saying, okay, well, we've gone through this topic, this topic, and this topic in the minutes. Dr. X arrives, and we go through this topic, this topic, this topic. And the reason to do that is to say, okay, well, these decisions were made without Dr. X in the room. And then these decisions were made with Dr. X's input. And all you're doing is just putting it in the minutes just to acknowledge what discussions took place with whom in the room at what time. Um, and usually I think uh, people will probably get the, the idea pretty quickly that they don't want their names to show up um, in the minutes. I know I wouldn't want my name to show up in the minutes as, as being late. A couple of no-nos, um, brainstorming. It's very easy. You know, we've all heard of these brainstorming sessions, but I don't know how many of you have truly been part of a, a great, great, true blue brainstorming session. And what I mean by that is brainstorming really should be non-judgmental. If you're running a meeting that is a brainstorming session where you're coming up with something new, you really have to emphasize and control the rest of the committee to not be judgmental, to stay away from judgmental uh, comments. It'll really kind of squash the creative process. Um, and those of you um, <clears throat> who know who John Cleese is, uh, those of you who are younger, John Cleese is of Monty Python fame. He's a comedian. Uh, but he's got actually a very, very good YouTube video out about um, how to be creative and how to inspire creativity uh, during, uh, during meetings. Um, it's something I would encourage you to watch. The other thing to set aside is it's not a classroom. If you're chairing a committee, it's not a classroom for you to control. I would argue that actually you're a facilitator of the process. You're a facilitator to get the agenda done and to deliver your deliverables. And so I would really kind of urge you to kind of put aside your personal agenda. It's actually sometimes very difficult to do. Um, I'm not always good at doing it, um, but I will, what I, what I try and do is say, okay, and it may sound very juvenile to do this, but what I do is I say, okay, well, I'm kind of just letting everyone know I'm kind of taking off my chairperson's hat right now, and now I'm putting on my body imager hat. And I say, as a body imager, I'm very much kind of against this because of this, this, and this. And so now, even though it sounds kind of juvenile, what you've done is you've kind of segregated and you've acknowledged to the committee, like, hey, I know I'm the chair, I know I'm kind of driving the agenda, I'm kind of facilitating, controlling the discussion, but I'm going to segregate those comments just, just to kind of put out there almost like a disclosure. Something to be aware of, uh, and it's something that 
you may or may not have encountered uh, yourselves, but there's, there's seating psychology when it comes to meetings. Some people are very territorial. Um, typically, uh, you can, uh, you know, if, if someone is sitting across from you, that, that's classically more of a confrontational posture. So the person that's directly across from you, is, it's more apt to be more of a confrontational um, or debate uh, uh, relationship in the meeting. Uh, the person immediately to the chairperson's right, that's called the dead zone for some reason. That person often gets ignored. So as a chairperson, you have to be aware that that person right to your right, you want to make, you want to make sure that they feel included. And uh, this is probably more applicable uh, in the old days when they had these really long tables, long rectangular tables. But if you had the chair or the, the person that was in charge at one end, um, there was typically this kind of gradation of responsibility on, on, in hierarchy. So the people at, all the way at the other end were kind of the, well, I'll say the medical, first year medical students. And over here would be your, your division directors and then your chairs. So um, just be aware of that. Just be aware of that dynamic. I think it's important as a chair that you're, you're engaging, inclusive um, uh, during a committee meeting. Something that uh, I actually discovered a couple years ago, um, and I found it useful in select uh, situations, is something called the check-in. Now, what the check-in is very useful for is for committees that uh, have very good friends on them. These people are very good at uh, have strong personal relationships outside of work or if it's a committee that meets very rarely. So these are people who normally wouldn't see each other maybe once a year. And what the check-in is, is basically you give everyone just, let's say, two minutes to kind of check in. And what they do is they talk about personal items. You know, I'm very interested and I'm very happy that, you know, your son graduated from high school. I'm very happy that, you know, your dog won first place in a dog show. But those types of conversations can sometimes derail a meeting. And so what the check-in does is that gives you an opportunity to kind of acknowledge those things, which are important. These are people's personal lives, and they're important. So it gives you a chance to kind of go around the table, acknowledge them, get them out of the open, and get them out of the way. And then you kind of get to focus on the agenda. There's also something called a checkout, um, which is useful um, to kind of put everyone on the same page um, at the end. How many of you have had a, a, a standing meeting? And I mean physically stand. All right, so good, actually, more than I expected. Um, and a standing meeting is literally just that. There are some companies that uh, will strictly enforce a 20-minute standing-only meeting room. And so if you want to have a meeting, you have to book a room. And the, the, there's only, like, the chairs, like you'll see, like, the, uh, like the uh, event tonight with the beer and the pretzels where you kind of stand around, you know, a little table. And what that does is that kind of forces people to be efficient. No one wants to stand around all day. And what it does is it forces people to be efficient. One of the anecdotes that I read in one of the uh, blogs was there was a meeting at a company that had uh, about 20 mid-level managers. And this meeting would last an hour and a half to two hours and was considered extremely wasteful. People would come to get their free donuts or just to put their two cents in on a topic that really may not have been truly uh, important. And so uh, what happened one day, though, is this, this group was coming in to meet, and the bigwigs had met in this room just before and had actually stolen all the chairs. So they were forced to meet standing up. How long did that meeting take? 20 minutes, and it was incredibly productive. And what happened in a very short time, the, the person that chaired that, that uh, committee decided, OK, well, this is how we're going to do all our meetings in the future. We're all going to be standing. Uh, so within a, actually a couple of weeks, the number of people that were uh, part of that committee went down to four, and the meetings routinely went down to 20 minutes and were incredibly efficient. So it's, it's a very effective uh, technique. Storytelling, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but there's, um, depending on the committee's purpose, it is sometimes very important to hear anecdotal stories, actually like the one I just told. Um, that can be very powerful in, in, in kind of putting a face or an experience to data. Um, and so just, just be aware that storytelling is actually very important in some committee uh, formats. What do I do with distracting, distracting uh, concepts, distracting uh, committee members, distracting topics? Um, you never want to directly address the person as distracting, right? You never want to say, oh, quit distracting the meeting. But what you can do, and which is very effective, some people have called this uh, put a pin in it. I'm going to put a pin in that topic, and we're going to come back to it later. The, the in vogue uh, phrasing now is, okay, we're going to put that in the parking lot. So that's a great idea. That's something we should definitely talk about. We're going to put it in the parking lot right now because we're going to focus on these things right, you know, 
uh, as part of our agenda. So that's something to do. It's a technique to use uh, when you have things that are kind of maybe steering off course uh, away from the agenda. And then always try and end uh, on a high note, whether it's some kind of uh, agenda item that everyone will agree on. Again, get everyone to kind of swim in the same direction, some kind of acknowledgement of achievement, um, some kind of high note um, that kind of gets everyone charged and feeling good about the mission of the committee um, that always works uh, quite well. In terms of resources, there's quite a bit out there, actually, particularly in the business literature. Um, you know, one of the, the uh, great articles that often gets cited is uh, How to Run a Meeting uh, by Anthony Jay, and it was actually from uh, March 1976 from the Harvard Business Review. Um, it's a great article. Uh, some of that content is in my presentation. And then more applicable or, or more centered on radiology, uh, Jeanette Collins uh, recently in JACR wrote about effective committees. Um, so uh, these are some resources out there uh, for you, but hopefully there are some practical points in here uh, for how to chair a committee and things to keep in mind. At this time, I'd actually like to welcome up uh, Dr. Uh, Mark uh, Mullins. He'll come on up and uh, to give his next uh, presentation. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, we will be doing uh, questions after or, or comments. Uh, so uh, when we're done with the session, we'll go through those. That's good, only about 30 people are leaving, so that's perfect. <laughs> um, all right, so everybody's been sitting for a while. Why don't you stand up and stretch for just a minute. Try to re redistribute some of your blood, that's good. That's good. And I am overjoyed again. Uh, you've renewed my sense in humanity by showing up here today, um, not only for the topic, but for the time of day. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. I um, want to say um, thanks to the programmers who put this together as well. I'm very happy that you're here supporting our programming this afternoon. Um, several times during the day, I've heard people bring up the question of, you know, how do they get involved? And um, I just want to tell all of you who have not been a speaker at AUR and, or have not been on a committee or have not been in the leadership and wonder how to do that at either AUR or any of the associations or alliances, just talk to one of us. Um, we love volunteers and um, it's much easier than you think to get involved. So please do uh, let us know. Eric's example of taking a conversation last year and turning it into a great talk this year between uh, Teresa and Eric, I thought it was a great example of where, you know, that, that creative um, process that we have when we come to, to AUR um, can be translated into something like this. So, um, so I'm going to talk about mentorship. Um, this is meant to be somewhat... Um, interactive and with a group this size, that's always a challenge. So uh, for those of you who care at all about me, please do talk to me when I ask you questions. Um, and this should go a lot more, it'll be a lot more fun that way, at least for me, uh, as far as we do that. Um, I don't have any uh, relevant conflicts of interest here, which reminds me I really need to get on the ball and get some more conflicts of interest for next year. Um, so it seems people don't want to give me money for some reason, which is interesting. Um, these are my learning centered learner objectives. Yeah, you have those in there and a good way for me to lose 10% of you is to read to you. So I'm not going to do that. Um, suffice it to say that I would like you to be able to walk away with something from this particular session. So I'm going to talk about a few pragmatic things in addition to, um, more philosophy, if you will. And, You'll notice that I mentioned the expression action plan at the end. We uh, hopefully will come back to that towards the end of this. Um, so what is mentorship? Uh, you'll see that my slides, most of them are placeholder slides. This gives us a chance to get to know each other a little bit. Um, I know some of you in, in the audience and I have some idea about why you might be here, um, but to help frame it just a little bit more, um, let's start with maybe an easier audience response interaction. So how many of you have had a mentor professionally? 
And it, I, it, is it possible that we didn't reach 100%? I hope not. Uh, that would make me sad in a lot of ways. Um, one of the big epiphany points, well, I, I'm a recovering program director. And so, <laughs> so like, uh, one of the things, um, so for my former residents out there, you all had nothing to do with this. It's not, you know, the, that comment that was about all the other residents, not about you guys. So, um, no, I'm just kidding. So, so the idea is that um, some of the epiphany points that I loved when I was a program director is when my residents would go and interact at a session like this. And first of all, the, one of the better things was when they realized they actually had it pretty good where they were. That's great. Um, and then the other part is where I heard over and over and over again, I never knew how important mentorship was. And it's very interesting. And I think people just need to have the organic experiences or perhaps be exposed to it over and over and over again to see the potential utility in their own life. And um, I'll ask another question. So how many of you have been a mentor? And usually, it, you know, that's about the same number. But you see there are a few, a, a few fewer hands at the time. Maybe you fatigued from the first question and couldn't answer. But more likely it is that you may not realize that you've been a mentor um, to some of the people that you've encountered. So um, one of the more interesting things I've found over my short career is where um, you have had an impact in someone's life where you didn't realize it. And so the, the, you thought that the relative interaction maybe didn't merit the, the effect that it had on that particular person. But then in your own ex experience, I bet you've had that, that as well. And so um, you encountered uh, influential people from time to time. So one of the things to discuss here is advice or, you know, friendship, mentorship. These are kind of, okay, what is a mentorship process? What's a mentorship relationship as compared to maybe some of these other words. Um, generally, the way I like to think about it is um, a relationship between two people where the mentor is trying to help the other person achieve some sort of success, which brings up another topic to talk about, which is what is success? And so a different talk that I give is about making a career out of uh, radiology education and one of the things that I talk about there is focusing on what you will consider success. I think that's where you should start. And then, of course, then you go on to what does your boss consider success? So that's an important thing because, um, you know, you want to start with you because that answer may be extremely different for different people. And furthermore, what I like to do is to parse it up into different sort of uh, questions. And I'm a person who will um, espouse a mosaic attenuation, uh, attenuation, mosaic mentorship model. Sorry, my physics comes out every now and then, so I apologize for that. Um, so the uh, mosaic mentorship model, where you have different mentors who serve different roles in, this, in that part of your life. And um, I'll give you an example. Um, and as, as uh, Tim pointed out, and, and Eric and Teresa, you know, they tell you anecdotes. I'm going to tell you a couple of anecdotes as we go through this as well. Um, you never know where this is going to come up. So when I was a resident, um, I remember I got involved in a project, and w I, the mentor for that project, the, the lead um, investigator for that project said, all right, um, we have a draft of the manuscript that we want to finish, and we are going to set... Uh, an appointment. It's going to be a couple hours long. I'm not going to take any phone calls. We're not going to have any, um, we're going to have all the co-authors. We're going to sit here in this room and at the end of this two hours we will have our, our final draft and we'll be done. And I cannot tell you how different that was than every other single experience I ever had writing a manuscript. And I felt like, you know, the birds were chirping and uh, it just, it was all lollipops and rainbows and kittens, and it was just great there. And I thought I had really learned something. And basically, it was complete happenstance that I happened to be doing this particular project. This PI just invited me to be on this project with them, and I just happened to learn that. But I learned that from a particular person, and so I still try to, I still try to work with that 
uh, when I'm doing stuff uh, with my own um, mentees and, and uh, the people I work with. So how do we work through the concept of advice and mentorship? Um, it's mostly the relationship part of it. Um, in some situations, the relationship is one that is constructed. And even in the first day of AUR, I've heard people um, both positive and negative on the idea of assigned mentors. Um, the way that I did it with our residents, we have a mentorship program. My residents will recognize it as an advising program. It's called advising, but it's really, you know, in a lot of ways a mentorship program. And we tried as best we could to make assignments for them that made sense based on what we knew about them and what we thought would work, you know, again, um, in terms of the matches. But then we also gave both the mentor and the mentee or the advisor and the advisee the opportunity to switch no questions asked to somebody else. Um, here at AUR, I've heard people say that they don't like mentorship programs because it needs to be organic. It needs to be a connection that you make with somebody else and then, you know, it's more, it has more longitudinal uh, success that way. And I, I think there's probably something to that. Because if I look back over the course of my life, for all the people that I've either been assigned to or they've been assigned to me, um, it's been a rare circumstance where it's been more than what was absolutely required of whatever process that we were working on. However, when it's occurred organically, it's been much more uh, successful longitudinally. Um, in this regard, the way that I approach it is that I will, I will start out with a mentee and say, um, I'll have a discussion about, okay, well, what do you want to get out of this? What, what do you want to get out of our relationship? And then what are your expectations in terms of like, you know, how often we should meet and what we should cover and talking about pragmatic aspects of it. And then I think, you know, we can negotiate a little bit about what the expectations would be. And I think that that's a useful place to start. I try to do that process uh, when I'm doing uh, research with people. I learned that from Scott Gazelle uh, when I was in Boston. About You sit down with somebody and you say, okay, I'm doing this, you're doing that, here are the expectations, here's the timeline, stuff like that. And we'll talk about it a bit more of that as we go through it. Um, but that helps also for people to understand the idea of, you know, how this is going to differ perhaps from the other relationships that they have. Um, and then what is good mentorship? Anybody have any examples? Give me some examples of, of uh, good mentorship, some things that um, a good mentor might do or some, some, some uh, approaches, even some adjectives would be nice. What do you think? Opportunities. Opportunities. So a good mentor, theoretically, is going to provide opportunity for a mentee. This comes up um, not infrequently, just in terms of the idea of where the mentor might take certain opportunities for themselves as opposed to passing things along and um, looking out for what you might say are the best interests of the mentee. One of the challenges to uh, the mentor-mentorship model is thinking in terms of a linear process. So it's natural, I think, for people to think very linearly. When I was a medical student, I thought about being an intern and a resident. When I was a resident, I thought about being a fellow. When I was a fellow, I thought about being a junior faculty member. When I was a junior faculty member, I thought about being a division director or a senior faculty member. Very linear kind of process. So you might look at the people who you report to as having your best interests in mind. So for example, division directors. If you're a faculty member in a division, you might think, okay, they're gonna have my best interests at heart. If they're a good person, they probably do have your best interest at heart a lot of the time. Of course, at the end of the day, they have some different responsibilities aside from being your mentor. So, for example, they have to make the schedule, and despite the fact you may want to go to AUR really, really badly, you may not be able to go because they have to make sure that the clinical coverage is, eff is effective in that particular week. And when push comes to shove, they're probably going to put that at a higher level than the development of you professionally. Um, another challenge, and, and one of the things I'd add to the excellent discussion about, so you want to be a section head, 
is the idea of how does it fit with your own career? Like, what, how comfortable are you about your own career at that particular stage to mentor someone at that, that other level? So when opportunities come up for you and you say, I really want to pass on this to my, I want to pass this on to my mentee, how comfortable are you going to be with that? If you take on a leadership position or take on a mentorship position and you're mentoring someone who's relatively close to where you are or you think they're relatively close to where you are in terms of the academic food chain, I think that you're going to think to yourself, like, okay, well, I need this more than they do, those kind of things. And that's where you need to kind of check yourself and think about how that you're going to look at those opportunities and how you might pass them along to that mentee. So there's a place where sometimes people get into trouble. I've heard of some very challenging situations where people have taken over ideas and taken over opportunities from people that weren't even for the mentor. They weren't even in the mentor's opportunity realm until the mentee kind of brought it up in terms of what should I do about this kind of questions. So that's good. What other, uh, what other words can we associate with, with good mentorship? What's that? Tough love. Tough love. Um, it's, it's interesting, and again, being a recovering program director, I can appreciate that, uh, that that's a good one. So the tough love concept of providing some realism and a reality check. Now, this can work in all sorts of different ways, and one of the ways that I think it works best is when you have people who are mentors for you that aren't in that direct line of reporting system. You need probably someone who knows your system but is not your direct boss and someone that you trust, which is another thing that hasn't come up yet, but you have to be able to trust them, right? You need to be able to, to talk with them and you need to work out the details of what is fair game there and if they're going to be able to hold that in confidence um, and where the limits of that confidence go <laughs> because, uh, you know, nothing's probably 100%. So, you know, you, you reach a certain point that, you know, it's okay, what is that going to be? And you need to be able to trust that person. And you probably also need mentors from outside of your system. You need to have uh, people who can give you that reality check that can say to you, you know what, your system sounds horrible. You, you're getting abused mightily, and this is just not fair. Or, or your system sounds fine, but you personally are getting abused. You know, these kind of things. And because I think it's a natural human tendency for people to, to, to say, okay, what I'm going through is normal. This is a typical situation that, that is everybody has this situation. I just need to learn to get through it. And sometimes you need that kind of perspective. You also need that kind of perspective to help put you back on the track of what is a reasonable expectation for circumstances. You may think you deserve a whole lot more than, than you actually do. And that, you know, that tough love part is a, is a good aspect of, of helping you do that. So that's great. I appreciate that. So we've got a few things. There might be more. Anybody, anybody else? Approachability. Approachability. Okay, so that's actually an excellent one for a mentor because it helps facilitate the organic process of um, you know, working out that relationship and being able to walk up. So I would say to you, um, for those of you who are in the room and are looking for, for mentors, um, there are a whole lot of super friendly people at AUR, um, and I'm sure that, you know, the vast majority of them are very approachable, at least I've found them to be that way, and I think there's a great, great opportunity to walk up and start a conversation. So when, when I have trainees that are looking at um, trying to get started on a project, which is akin to what we're talking about of, of, of uh, gathering a mentor relationship, um, I have basically three versions of it. One is where um, the, the, the potential mentee has particular interests and they don't know exactly who to work with. Another one is that they want to work with a particular person. And then uh, another one is, well, they don't particularly have particular interests, but they just want somebody. And, and so we've had success with all of those. But the one that I have the least experience with, both in where I work and here, 
is when they want to work with someone in particular because everybody's so approachable. No, well, not everybody, but never say never, never say always. But you know, so many people are so approachable that you can move up and uh, just say hello and just start a conversation. Um, and I have had, I've had people who we've developed a mentor-mentee relationship from exactly that version. Um, so, any more? Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Um, I want to pull on that thread a little bit. So, when you, when you say reciprocity, can you give me a for instance? So, sure. I, I mean, there's, um, so I think the mentorship is an active process. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They're actively involved, and in, and in, this is a relationship. This is a two-way relationship. This is a situation where you you want it, both groups need to value this particular circumstance. One of the things people focus on, that's great. So one of the things people focus on is, you know, what does the mentor get out of this? And we, you know, we, we talked about a few potential side roads there in terms of, like, opportunity and, you know, needing to trust them and, and stuff like that. Um, but generally, most of the time, it's just, you know, the, the, the person, the mentee's success or, or their involvement in this process and just having that relationship is supposed to be, you know, the, the feel-good moment part of that. Part of that certainly is their engagement of that. How engaged is each person in that relationship towards the, um, the relationship of the mentor-mentee? One of the axioms here is that, and again, it hasn't come up organically yet, so I'll just throw it out there, is to be a great mentor, it's really important to be a great mentee. Um, Things changed for me when I realized that people that I knew had mentees which continued through their entire careers. So I know deans that have other deans as mentees. Another transitional time for me was to realize that, you know, it, it was, it, you know, it, a version of what I just said is that it's, it's never going to stop. It's a, it's a continuum. And I think that's really important. And much like when I do teaching, uh, the more I do the teaching part, the better I understand something. And I think it's the same way with the mentor-mentee uh, relationships. That's good. Um, so why is it important? Um, many of you are here. This is a great turnout, uh, which I appreciate. Um, amongst other reasons, and aside from the parts of where it may be um, enjoyable to you personally, which I hope it is, um, if you're in, a, in an academic system, it is likely, based on the academic systems that I'm familiar with, it is likely that they give you some recognition, if not some responsibility, around the idea of mentorship. And um, that's extremely important, um, certainly in our system and the systems I'm aware of. So it may be important to your own personal um, promotion as well as your progress through the system. And then um, in a bigger picture, talking a little more philosophically, this is about the future. And again, you probably, I hope, have had mentor-mentee relationships that have so positively affected your career as to appreciate it for what it's worth. And in that regard, I hope that you can see how, if you want to use expressions like paying it forward or you know, continuing it, that, you know, that's the idea, that it, it's important to kind of uh, give on to the next generation. We can talk about, um, we could talk about the literature, we could talk about research, we could talk about what aspects of this are important, but I like to talk about a little more of the pragmatic stuff as we go through it. Um, how do you become a mentor? Well, the first part is to leverage your experience as a mentee. Um, I, you know, most of you raised your hands when I asked you if you'd been a mentee. Uh, for the rest of you, you probably just didn't even realize you were a mentee at the time. Uh, someone else may have thought of you as a mentee, which I find is an interesting uh, experience when people aren't exactly clear on that part. Um, but that's, that's your first stage, if you will. And then, of course, uh, there's that transitional period to becoming the mentor. What's really cool about 
the stages that we're involved in regarding medical education, to me anyway, is that you can be a mentor practically from the time you know, of, of medical school on. And you'll see it in the way that the systems are set up because a lot of the systems now include this where, say, for example, a more junior medical student is aligned with a more senior medical student. Maybe it's called a mentorship situation. Maybe they're an advisor, maybe big brother, big sister. I don't know. Just those kind of things. And it becomes um, a little more... Um, a little more official as time goes on if you're on the academic path. Um, so how do you become a better mentor? So this is an area where you want to pay attention to your craft. And I think that you can um, talk to people and pick up things in the mosaic mentorship approach to life where you're going to learn different things from different people. And you can't be all things to, to every one of your mentees. It's probably just not going to work out that way. And you may not even serve the same purpose for each of your mentees. Each of your mentees may get something different from you. And you may learn things um, from your peers, which I think is useful as well. To this point, um, I've mentioned some examples of where the mentor-mentee relationship is classically around someone who's more junior being the mentee and someone who's more senior being the mentor. But because of the different hats that we wear in our lives, our professional lives, um, you could easily have someone who is a mentor to you personally who is uh, much younger than you or more junior than you in a certain way, but they're, they, are, um, they would be a great resource for you and a great mentor for you in some particular aspect of your professional life. And if you've never thought about that, I encourage you to do so. And if you think that's not possible for yourself, I say get over yourself. You know, that's one of those things where that's holding you back. You know, like if you, if you say, you know, I, I, I learn a lot from um, my, my you know, people that are, are junior to me. Uh, when I go in on a readout um, and somebody has a better way of, of looking at something, I think that's fantastic. You know, I, I think that's a great way to do it. And otherwise, you know, you miss some great opportunities uh, to get better. So let's talk about a few ground rules around the idea of being, you know, a mentor or a mentee. I think one of the big things to start with is, as we said before, to help frame what the expectations are. This could be specifically things like, okay, how often are we going to meet? How, um, how long are we going to meet for? Um, what are we going to discuss? What are the things that are, you know, like what, what are we going to focus on? What are going to be the deliverables, if any? Um, where does the line, where's the line drawn, you know, in terms of the topics and the confidentiality aspect of it, which I, I think is a good one for you to kind of work through. So those are, those are some, some important things to kind of work through, and um, I encourage you to do that right away. So how I choose to manage um, a relationship like this, as well as when someone wants to do uh, a project with me, is I will give them something small and see what they do with it. So, for example, if someone says they want, they want this kind of relationship, well, okay, um, arrange for some time for us to meet, and then we'll get together, and I'll make myself available to you. We'll work it out, and then we'll have that first mentorship meeting. And it's interesting how hard it is for some people to take that small step, and that gives me some insight into what that relationship is going to be like. And perhaps it's not going to be uh, um, a beneficial mentor-mentee relationship. And I think that's important to know right out of the gate. And, um, you know, and everybody's busy. That's one of those things. It's preferable to have these meetings in person but failing that, if someone's sufficiently motivated, we can actually have some of these discussions over the phone. If your mentor-mentee relationship persists over enough time, I think it's relatively um, inevitable that you'll have mentor-mentee discussions on the phone. Because what will happen is, if it goes on long enough, people will move around, they get busier, they have other things going on, but it's still important enough for them 
to talk to you about something that comes up. You know, a, a new opportunity comes up and they want to run it by you, or they have a situation going on in their life and they want to run that by you as well. Um, so far, I've focused on professional aspects of, of mentor-mentee relationship. Um, I believe very strongly in the work-life balance, and of course, in a lot of our lives, there's a, you know, it's hard to figure out where some of those lines are drawn. Um, and that can be part of the process that you work out with your uh, mentee or your mentor, um, what you're going to include in terms of that part of it as well. So I encourage you to, to have that as part of the discussion, it, you know, whether it comes up organically uh, at the beginning or not. Um, let's talk about how we do it at our place. Um, we do junior faculty development, which I'm sure a lot of you do as well. And um, all of our new junior faculty members are automatically enrolled in the junior faculty development course that we put on within our department. We also have stuff that the university does, and we, we try to get people to go to that as well. Part of the junior faculty development course is being assigned a mentor where there's, you know, people have to meet at least once, and then they go on and try to decide, is this particular match going to work, or do we need a different kind of, of match? And the process that we use to determine that initial match is, again, trying to dis discern what that individual person might get out of that relationship that's in addition to the other organic, natural um, mentor-mentee relationships that they have. Almost always, this mentor that's chosen for them to be the initial mentor is someone who is not in the same division. And in some cases, they may be a research person um, where the, the mentee may be a clinical person. And, but we wouldn't, I, we wouldn't choose, I, I don't think we would choose a situation where a research person would be chosen for someone who had absolutely no interest in research. Using the, um, you know, the four pillars approach that Eric was talking about, what I try to talk about with people is I think you know, people, sh people need to be excellent at two of the four. And the key is to not be bad at the other two. That's, that's part of the, the issue there. Don't be bad. Be, be supportive of where the other two you know, come along there. And um, one of those two needs to be clinical medicine if you're a clinician. And I bristle when people say the clinician when they mean a non-radiologist. I'm a clinician too. So when you do clinical medicine, including radiology, you need to be excellent there. And you kind of get, get to choose another focus. So if your focus is going to be research, you know, that might be one of those areas. But you're still a clinical person. You still have a division director. There would be a natural mentor to have in that particular situation. And then we run it for over a two-year process, and then we see how it goes. And occasionally people need to, to switch. And um, this is a circumstance where, it, and this is in addition to um, development otherwise for faculty stuff. You may wonder about developing our mentors and choosing our mentors, and that's, that's another thing that we, we do is to try to figure out who, who has a better skill set at being a mentor in terms of making these alignments. We also have gone through uh, processes where we, we have actual talks on mentorship as well and being a mentor and being a mentee, and we value stuff like uh, this particular topic at national conferences. Um, a few years ago, uh, I was asked to do a vodcast, which was part of a process that was focused on um, residents, and um, this is one that I did, and it has, um, it has a, a bit on mentorship in it, um, and a little more on, on the focus of um, the literature, so I just wanted to mention that one to you. Um, and then this was a, um, a reference from a couple of years ago that I think is, um, leads me towards the idea of, of something that my colleague Ernie Garcia at, at Emory likes to talk about, which is personal strategic planning. And part of the personal strategic planning process, at least from my vantage point, revolves around the idea of looking at what you want to have happen. So I like to talk to people about the revolving one year, five year, and 10 year you know, sort of look, look ahead from wherever you are currently, trying to figure out your plan, your one-year, your five-year, and your 10-year plan. And of course, that should 
evolve over time. It will probably not be the same plan for your entire life, um, and that's appropriate. Uh, your value systems will modify, and thus your need for mentorship will evolve a little bit as time goes on. But to help put things in perspective and to also help you figure out what you know, what you can and should be working on and opportunities that come up that you can and, and should take and some that you shouldn't take, um, that those are situations in which having a, a, a great mentor uh, can be very helpful to you. Um, it's my guess that everybody in the room, uh, you have either reached the level of needing to say no to opportunities, or you soon will uh, for practically every, everybody in the room, uh, because just by virtue of you being here, my guess is you're switched on and opted in, and this is going to be one of those things. How do you figure out what to say no to? Um, and it's an art in terms of how to do it. Um, and who can you say no to? And when can you say no? And those kind of things. And, and, and when should you say no? And part of the mentorship process um, is around stuff like that, or classically it is in academic radiology. So that's something, hopefully, that will be of utility to you. Um, I think um, that... I don't know where I'd be today um, if not for mentorship that I've received um, over the course of my life. Um, I grew up in the rural Appalachian Mountains, um, and uh, I have no idea uh, where I'd be today without um, the excellent mentorship that I've received over the course of time. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that there are people who I've considered to be mentors who have no idea that I've considered them to be mentors. Um, and I feel sad about that. I would really like to let them know, but um, you know, maybe time will give me, uh, fate hopefully will give me an opportunity to do that in my life. I've already lost some opportunities, but you never know. Um, and I try to give it back um, every chance that I get. Um, although uh, you know, there are certain circumstances in which I try my best to be a mentor to someone who you know, I've either been assigned to or, or that they've said they wanted to me to be a mentor, and it just hasn't worked out. So I'm definitely, I definitely understand where the organic part fits in. I'm a, I'm a person who likes to kind of take different systems and put them together, try to find balance between systems. So I see utility in both the assignments, but also in the organic process as well. I said differently, maybe one size doesn't fit all. Um, I guess we're going to do questions as a group, and we have just a few minutes. At least I didn't run over. It's good. All right, thank you. If you look this happy that I stopped talking, I'm really sad, but that's not <laughs> good. Thank you, Mark. I'll just invite, actually, Mark, why don't you stay up here? I'll actually just invite our speakers on up. And uh, if anyone has any questions, they can uh, either just raise their hands or approach the mic. Comments, points of discussion. Everyone is ready for beer and pretzels, <laughs> it looks like. No harm in finishing 10 minutes early. All right, well, thank you all very much for your attention. I appreciate that, and thank you to our speakers. Have a great evening. That's right.